I'm gonna take the key out and unlock the seat as part of this process. This is a bit of a deep dive. This is a long video. I'm gonna be installing a Chimera Chimera cold air intake with a K&N filter and a Power Commander 5 in this Grom SF. This process is an incredibly long process. It involves metric inset M6 and M5 uh, bolts. You have to remove the fairings. I didn't do this with instructions. I did this just by figuring it out as I go. I didn't watch any YouTube videos. I just kind of winged it and figured it out. And you're going to see me fumble through the whole thing. Um, I will time lapse some of these sections to speed this along. Uh, you can see as I move along there, um, this is exploratory. I don't have a user manual. I don't have any instructions. I'm just taking screwdrivers and push pegs and taking uh, experience I've had disassembling the front end of the Prius that's parked in the garage next to the Grom. These um, push and fit connectors and all these different fasteners and types of things. The body panels by far were one of the most annoying and difficult parts of this process. Maybe having a guide that shows you which screw goes where. I ended up just figuring it out on my own. I'm sure you can too. It's not complicated. All the screws are kind of different. There's groupings of different ones. It's obvious what goes where and what's not if you actually stop and look at the fasteners and think about it. At any rate, be careful when you're pulling on the bodywork. Um, it is fastened by these weird little push-in deals. They're like a, a stud, like a rectangular stud with some kind of blue rubber on it. It pushes into a hole with kind of like a grommet fitting. Um, that holds the bodywork in place while you're bolting and unbolting and screwing and unscrewing it. They basically use a combination of 10 millimeter bolts, uh, metric inset heads, and Phillips screws uh, for the entire uh, body shell. I was never able to get the left side entirely off. Under the rear fender, there's three screws. Uh, there are offset collar screws on each side of the rear fender. These collar screws are incredibly tight from the factory. I mean, super tight. And the way the chain shroud uh, exists on the left side doesn't allow a normal screwdriver to access the bottommost screw. And so that screw, as you'll see me struggling with it later here, turns out to be one of the most complex and hardest parts. In fact, it's not in the video, but I completely stripped the head of that screw. I tried using every tool I have to remove it, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to take it to a mechanic tomorrow and have them help me easy out. Fortunately, I have the day off. But you can tell uh, from the effort required, you want to pull on these body panels just hard enough, but not so hard as to shear them off and break the mounting points if you've never removed them before. Just kind of go slowly, pry. I used a screwdriver, or a, uh, I used a flashlight, and you'll see me doing it, to look down, to look for attachment points, since I don't have any instructions. Here comes the flashlight. Uh, this is a, a Nebo Twist Z. It has a uh, articulating head that can focus wide and narrow. Here I'm, I'm trying to inspect from the front, looking in to see how is this fender, uh, this side fairing, attached. I'm looking for attachment points and kind of pulling on it. Oh, there we go. Get some, some play. And then it appears that, unfortunately, the front fairing and rear fairing are interconnected, so I'm going to have to disconnect that to take the fairing off. You need to remove the fairing uh, to take the OEM air box out because it's hooked up to the throttle body, and uh, there's a vacuum hose, and there's a peg, and there's bolts above it, and basically it's impossible to remove the uh, OEM air box without removing the fairings. Um, it's super easy. You just have to kind of wrestle it out of there. You'll see that later in the video. Uh, this is the part where I'm removing those screws on the right side. I was able to successfully remove all of the screws on this part, on the right rear part of the fairing. It was only the one on the bottom on the left side that really gave me trouble. Um, 
They're uh, kind of a black anodized screw. It's got a small collar and that's to accommodate for the fairing. So all these screws clip into, they screw into a clip that's attached to a plastic bracket. It's actually a clever design. Then one fairing piece attaches to the other and the offset in the head of the bolt or the screw is to accommodate for the thickness of one fairing piece screwing into the other so that you don't tighten down and smash the plastic. The, the idea is to have it snug but not smashed. If you t over tighten plastic with the screw, it has this property called creep where the screw will cause the plastic to kind of deform and ooze, very slowly ooze away from the, the pressure point. If you've done any kind of 3D printing, this should be well familiar. If you screw into 3D prints, it's a really good idea to use a bolt and a brass insert. And this is kind of like the method that Honda uses. Um, they use these little uh, stainless steel uh, enameled or um, I'm not sure what kind of coating. It has a black coating on it that's not paint. Um, it's a, it's a self-guiding, uh, kind of like a nut. And that goes into a, over the hole and that reinforces the plastic tab. Then the, the frame screws and nuts actually screw into that. Here I'm using a, um, a screwdriver to remove. There's two main bolts in the rear holding the rearmost fairing in place. I never fully remove that. I'm, I'm basically just loosening the side fairing up, uh, trying to figure out how to gain access to the front. And it seemed interconnected, so... Um, here I'm applying an extension to my socket. Uh, this uh, this Nebo tool is actually one of the most useful tools. You can articulate the head, so here it's, it's in a 90 degree angle, but then there's a little pin you can press on the front to turn it into a direct driver style. Uh, this bolt here, um, is, it's the same on both sides, so if you figure out one side, you've automatically figured out the other. So. This first side is really the learning side. As you remove one side, try to keep track of your bolts. I was more careful with where I set the bolts on the first side so I could kind of figure out the groupings in order. The second time I haphazardly did it, just roughly memorizing. If you're gonna do something like this, um, make sure you're feeling sharp. Don't use any cannabinoids. Those can impact your working memory. Uh, don't drink alcohol. If you're going to do anything, do it in the morning and drink a caffeinated beverage like unsweetened green tea or coffee. Something to sharpen up your mind. Use nice bright lighting too. Here I have thousands of lumens of overhead LED uh, in my garage. That helps to keep everything well lit. Um, again, when you're pulling on these, these panels, the plastic panels are expensive if you break them. So do it uh, gingerly and forceful with great intentionality. You don't want to overdo it. And um, you don't need a lot of tools, just a 10 millimeter driver, a couple of uh, different screwdrivers. I, I brought out more tools than I actually needed just in case. It's nice to have an extra tool if you find something you weren't expecting. Having the right tool for the job makes it uh, useful. Here, um, you have to remove part of the front fairing to gain access to the side bolt. Otherwise, you'd have to use a box wrench uh, to undo it. It's a 10 millimeter uh, deal. And that right there allows the side fairing to come off. And now we can see the complex core with all the wires and connectors. Um, the main target here is the, the front. I attempt uh, to remove this cowling, but um, turns out you don't actually need to fully remove the cowling. You just need it to be able to wiggle out of the way. Um, it's attached, I'm not sure, it's attached at the top with a central Phillips screw that, I'm not sure how you're supposed to get that one out. This is me puzzling along, uh, wondering if it's even possible. I even tried to use this real small finger screwdriver and. Uh, I decide, you know what, it's not worth it. I don't think I actually need to use uh, something to remove the, the cowling. I even take, um, I say, well, one more time. I'm going to take just the, the Phillips piece from a drill driver and a crescent wrench and see if I can wiggle that in place. There's just not a lot of clearance between the center of the triple clamp 
and this screw that holds down the life or the uh, gas tank cover. So I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a trick to that. You might ask the Honda dealer if you're inquisitive. If you know a trick, please leave a comment in the video. I'm not, I'm not exactly clear on how you'd remove something like that without, uh, without taking the front off the bike, and that's certainly overkill for this kind of procedure. The procedure for removing the stock airbox is pretty simple. You're going to loosen up um, a band tightener. I forget what they're called. It's like a circ clamp, circuit clamp. That's what attaches the plastic polymer intake uh, to the throttle body. Um, thankfully, it's a real flexible rubber-like polymer. Otherwise, removing it would have been a lot harder. Um, you've got two throttle cables in the way, and there's actually a air temperature sensor that you're going to remove with a Phillips from the um, from the OEM air box and you're going to put that into the uh, the bung welded onto the side of the cold air intake. Um, that part is so that the ECU can calculate uh, the air fuel ratio by measuring the intake air. So it's absolutely important that you remove this sensor from the OEM air box and install it into your new cold air intake. Um, that way the fuel air mixture is correct. And um, in terms of the power commander, it helps with uh, the ECU interacting with the um, map on the power commander because the OEM ECU is going to attempt to learn the new configuration uh, and the power commander is going to edit uh, the fuel injector timing, uh, mostly under wide open throttle to richen up the mixture. Uh, free flowing engine with uh, aftermarket exhaust and the air intake can breathe a lot more easily. And in an air-cooled engine like this, this could cause the temperatures to get to in excess of 210. And that's bad because high oil temperatures are essentially bad for the engine. Uh, under the worst case, if you're revving it to the moon, that would be north of 8,000 and overheating the engine. You could actually melt the aluminum uh, piston to the cylinder wall and effectively brick your motor. That's a pretty involved procedure to undo. So it's better to be safe and use an aftermarket fuel controller. Um, the Power Commander 5 here was chosen because um, it allows for flexibility with future updates. If we were to install um, the Takagawa 143cc uh, big bore kit or the Koso 170 big bore kit or the 181, Takagawa kit or any big board kit, the power commander can be plugged into a Windows laptop and uh, reflashed with an appropriate uh, tuning map. It can also uh, take an auto tune or wideband tuner. Um, to use the auto tuner wideband tuner, you're going to need to weld uh, a bung to the exhaust and then install an oxygen sensor and wire that to the wideband. That's pretty much essential if you're going to do a big bore kit. Uh, that's outside of the scope of what we're doing here. We're just doing a cold air intake, exhaust, and power commander. I call this stage one tuning. Stage one tuning maybe increases the horsepower from 9 to 10 and a half or 11. I don't have a dynamometer or dynometer or dynometer. I don't have a way of measuring it. I have a seat dyno. So after I was done with this installation, I let it warm up for three minutes and then took it easy for the few, first few minutes while the engine was warming up and then got on the highway and let it rip. And it definitely has more highway performance 
with the aftermarket exhaust just by itself with the paperclip reset of the ECU. Once the power commander and cold air intake are installed, you can feel even more. So the system really up around six and 7,000 starts to pull more, or it helps you actually keep up with traffic at 50 to 65 miles per hour better. Um, ultimately, the goal of this bike is to get the horsepower up to about 14 and then re-gear the front sprocket to plus one and the rear sprocket to minus one or minus two so that it can go 70 miles per hour without revving it to the red line. And that means it will be able to go on the interstate or I could have Meg on the back and ride two up and actually have the engine in uh, what we'll call normal cruising uh, RPMs. Um, we're not trying to build a cruiser here. This is a stunt bike. It's a uh, toy monkey bike. It's a fun bike. It has a short wheelbase, 12 inch wheels. This is not some kind of race bike, although it does have pretty aggressive styling. Uh, this device was not designed to replace a super sport. I've had super sport motorcycles. My first bike was a 99 Honda 600 F4. Uh, I had that for about five years as a carbureted 600cc super sport. That's not what we're going for here. Uh, this is more of a, a neutered bike. It, um, it can't go crazy fast and that's the idea is that it's it's a safe, sane motorcycle. In fact, it's an ideal first bike, and Meg's going to be taking her motorcycle training course, and she actually learned how to shift into and out of first gear on the Grom. Uh, that was her first time operating a motorcycle. Meg also bought this motorcycle, meaning it's technically her motorcycle, but she asserts that it's mine, and she wants to use our Honda PCX scooter since it's an automatic and technically has more horsepower than, than the Grom. It can comfortably go uh, around 65 on the freeway with its automatic V-belt transmission. No chain cleaning on the PCX2, which is a real blessing. I bought a rear stand to lift this one up so I can clean and lubricate the chain. It's much more important to lubricate chains than to clean them. Uh, obviously, if you're on a dirt road or something, cleaning it's also important, but if you're mostly on a clean highway and clean neighborhood roads and stuff, just keep that chain well lubed. A lot of people use 90 weight gear oil or heavier. Um, I just use commercial chain, luber, uh, chain lube. I apply too much and then wipe the excess off the outside of the links. If you leave too much chain lube on the outside of the links, dirt tends to stick to it and it fouls the chain faster. So you, what you really want to lubricate are the O-rings in the factory chain. You want to keep them wet. You don't want them to dry out. Uh, dry O-rings fail and then they let the oil from the inside of the roller leak out and then friction increases and then here you're seeing me. This is the beginning of a highly annoying. I put the force of God. Here's where I'm first having trouble with it. Oh, it's, it's not. Oh, it's slipping. There I stripped the head, I think, right at the very beginning. Just not really my my screwdriver maybe was a little too long um is it down downhill i end up trying multiple times with different tools on this one uh, if if i showed a picture of it the head is just absolutely mangled what started out as a phillips uh, frame fastener for the rear fender ended up uh, shredded and it actually bent one of my uh, blade tips on a I tried the Nebo tool and a socket attachment. See if maybe I can, I, I end up going back to this uh, several different times. Um, yeah, I'm sure you'll have better luck than I did with this part. If you're patient enough to watch the entire video, you'll see the, the struggle I went through to do this. I probably put too much energy into trying to get that rear bolt out. I'm going to time lapse a lot of the rest of this here. Um, I'll slow it down to real speed for the airbox removal and the power commander install. All right then, thanks for watching. I have uh, several other videos on the Honda Grom. Um,
it's a learning process making these videos. I'm not a mechanic and I'm not a professional YouTuber. This is just a hobby. I've been making fun video clips for years. Um, this is uh, something I like doing, but I'm a one-man team. I do all the editing. This is captured using just a cell phone. In this case, I mounted my iPhone SE to a selfie stick, which is zip-tied to a camera tripod. And most of my recent ROM videos and many of my tripod-related uh, videos are captured using this uh, iPhone. It's amazing how cell phone cameras uh, allow people to videotape things. And in fact, one of the most distinguishing features of an iPhone is its video capture ability. Though editing these videos uh, requires a very powerful computer, in this case, I do it on a 2015 iMac 27 inch uh, 5K rig using iMovie. I've never purchased any editing software. I've been using iMovie since 2008. It's stupid simple uh, to use. And if you want to try making video clips and you have an iPhone and a Mac, uh, give iMovie a try. It's free, it's included software, and it allows for clip editing and time lapse and adding voiceovers and doing all kinds of stuff. So here I'm, I'm loosening up the, uh, the fairing on the left side. Um, I never fully removed this one uh, due to that, that bolt in the rear, that, that screw bolt. And here you'll see that I go to try to remove it again. I really wanted to remove the left fairing just so I could do both sides the same way, but alas, you don't need to, and it's flexible enough to bend it out of Way to get to the 10 millimeter bolts retaining the OEM airbox to the central frame tube assembly. All right, here comes that time lapse. Oh, what a relief. Here you can see I finally wiggled the air box off. Wow, this was uh, a lot more involved than I thought to, to get this thing out of here, but it's not hard. Just stick to it. You can do anything you set your mind on. I'm not a mechanic. Uh, boom. There it goes. And uh, thank Honda for making those pipes flexible. That makes removing it a lot easier. There it is, the OEM airbox. Let's take a closer look at it. There's the front, because there's the back. That's right there is where it connects to the intake. To the throttle body. Here we have the snorkel. That's the snorkel where it sucks air in. I'm gonna flip it around. There's the part that connects to the throttle body with its clamp. Tighten it on. Some kind of viewer knob for fluters. I'm not sure. There's the vacuum knob. There's uh, the intake again. Take a close look there. Flip it around. That's the OEM intake.
I took off the circ clip that came with it and install a proper uh, Phillips Titan hose clamp that I had sitting on a shelf. It happened to be the perfect size. This is the crankcase breather tube. It's going to go into this uh, this knob, this uh, port knob on the side of the Chimera. I believe it feeds crank ventilation gases into the intake to be burned in the engine. At any rate, I put that um, retaining strap, uh, I forget what they're called, it's like a metallic fastener. It's a much stronger connection than the circlip on that tube. I didn't cut the tube to length, I just folded it over. Uh, that does create a clearance problem later when you're reinstalling the uh, train, the frame trim pieces. Uh, don't worry about it, just kind of tuck it behind the ignition coil like that and then put the panel back on. The tube is a very durable, uh, kind of like rubbery stuff, so it's not going to get hurt. Um, make sure you put all the uh, ignition wire and uh, everything back in the little holders. They have little wire holders and retainers all over the place. That's the Power Commander 5 uh, in its OEM retail box. It includes lots of parts and uh, covers and port covers and cable. This is a plug and play unit. Um, routing the cable is going to be the trickiest part. I use uh, about five zip ties to snug everything up. Um, this is kind of an up to you how you attach it. Here we're going to change the angle. This top down view gives a better idea. You're going to find the uh, ECU for the bike, mounted in a little rubber, kind of like grommet holder, attached to a metal peg, kind of a wide rectangular peg piece. Um, you can pull that off, put pressure on the back of the clip. The way this works is you squeeze the back and then it releases the uh, ECU module. You can send these into a group like OM, OM, OHM, they'll reflash your ECU. Uh, it's about a hundred bucks. It's cheaper than doing the power commander route. Um, they'll map it for like an aftermarket intake. Here I, I, I really hook everything up before I really thought about how to route the cable, but then upon installing the cable I realized that you can actually snake the cable through the frame rail and uh, I'll fast forward along so you can see how that works.
Here's a handful of zip ties. I'm going to use these zip ties to snug up all the wires for the power commander. Uh, later I actually install the velcro they, they include on top of the battery bracket and then stick the uh, power commander down and then I have a zip tie over on the top of that too to hold everything nice and snug. Um, it's, it's good to make sure when you're snugging up wires to frame rail components that you snug them up to a smooth piece you don't want any sharp edges into a wire bundle. If you were to zip tie something to a sharp wire bundle, that could cause vibration to rub the sharp edge onto the insulator and slowly progressively cut through the insulator and could lead to a short circuit, which is bad. You want your wire insulators to stay intact. So when you zip tie, think about what you're zip tying. Don't over tighten the zip ties to just snug. You're going for snug. You're just trying to Kind of gently hold the, the wires in place so they don't vibrate around. It's nothing, um, you have to torque on it or pull them tight. I didn't even cut the ends off. I just folded them over. Um, I might do that in the future. It's just that I was running short on time here. And this ended up taking uh, three times longer than I thought. So, uh, yep, that's uh, unnecessary to cut the ends off anyways. Um, may look a little cleaner and... Certainly, if you're trying to remove every bit of weight, uh, a twentieth of a gram of plastic here and there from the ends of the zip ties could make an incremental dis difference. But honestly, if you're trying to go a little bit faster, uh, fast for the day before, and uh, or maybe try fasting two or three days before you're gonna go race your grom around. If absolute weight makes a big difference. Uh, you could um, wear lighter clothing, uh, tighter clothing that's more aerodynamic. Uh, there's other ways to gain speed other than removing uh, maximum amount of weight. Just food for thought. After you get this power commander mounted, it's uh, time to put everything back together. So um, find a, a way that you want to mount it. I just use a zip tie right through that battery strap and over the top, kind of near the status light area. That holds it snug, but I end up using the Velcro uh, underneath that along with it. And that makes a more secure connection. Here I'm just kind of tightening it down with just a zip tie. Pull that kind of snug. Don't want that computer vibrating around. Uh, the Velcro acts as kind of a shock damper underneath the uh, Power Commander as well. I'm going to put this into super zoom mode so you, you can see it with time lapse. Otherwise, it's 35 minutes of real time speed. Cheers and thanks for watching.
All right, now it's time to fire it up. 